never forsake us. You never take us someplace that you are not there beside us. So God, continue to build our trust in you. Continue to strengthen our faith. Continue to make your promises even more clear and assured in our hearts. And we can lead you. We can follow where you lead us beyond what our sight tells us. So we follow you by faith. God, your word says that our faith is built by hearing your word. So this morning as we open your word, your inspired word to us, I pray that your Holy Spirit would shine a light on that word, that you would build faith in us as we hear it, that you would strengthen us in you, and that we would follow wherever it is that you lead us. Let us be people that are wholly dedicated to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A right, real quick survey, how many of you um, going to church has been a part of your life for like a long, long time? How many of you have been going to church for a long time? All right, a lot of you, almost everybody. You know what happens to us whenever, um, whenever we do anything for a long period of time? We start to just do the thing without actually looking at the thing or saying, why am I doing the thing that I'm doing? So church is no exception to that. We can do church and never stop to really say, why is it that we do what we do when we're doing church? You know what we just, because I mean, if you think about it, if you go back and, and look through say the new Testament, um, Jesus never gave us kind of Hey, when you get together, when you're having church together, this is the way that you should do it. Um, he had all kinds of different things. You know, sometimes he was in the synagogue. Sometimes he was standing out on a, on a boat just slightly off the edge of the shore so he could talk to the people. Sometimes they were up on a mountainside talking. Sometimes they were in somebody's house. Um, I, you know, there's all these different settings. And even when you get into a little later on in the New Testament, when you start looking at the apostles, um, you know, Paul writes a couple of letters to some young pastors, Titus and Timothy, and he doesn't write anything in there for them that, hey, when you get together, when you have a church service, this is what you should do, and, and here's your order of service. And yet, if we were to go anywhere in the country today, walk into any church, we probably wouldn't be surprised by how they do church. It's pretty much the same everywhere we go, right? I, there's going to be some songs, there'll be some announcements, there'll be an offering, uh, there'll be a sermon or a homily, there'll be some kind of benediction that will close it out. Now, some things might change as far as like um, the music goes. It might be in, a, uh, in kind of a cathedral setting and a big pipe organ and a choir that sings a song. Or it might be um, sound more like a, uh, a rock band and there's a lot of electric guitars and drums and and, and that sort of thing. When, when we collect the offering, it might be a metal tray, it might be a velvet bag, it might be a wooden box in the back of the room. And, and so the, the actual methods of what we do might be slightly different, but the format itself is, is kind of the same, which always makes me question then, so why, where did we adopt that? Where did that come from? What, why, why are we still continuing to do that now and, and because it's, we look at the Bible, it's nowhere in there. Somewhere along the line, somebody started doing it. And so I want to take probably more than just one step back. I want to go several steps back and try to capture what was supposed to happen. What, what did Jesus have in mind? What did the apostles have in mind? How did the, the early church leaders do it when, when they started their, their church service? What was, what was the idea behind that? Hey, Jeff, I think my mic is just a little too hot. I'm hearing a little ring here, if you wouldn't mind. So if you would look with me, if you have your Bibles, I want you to look at 1 Peter. We're going to 
We're going to look at just one verse here where Peter is talking about a gathering of Christians, um, or as we've called it in the series, as, as Peter's called it, aliens and strangers, people that are, they have uh, stepped into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, then they are look unusual compared to the world. They are aliens and strangers compared to the world. Now, we have seen here um, over the last couple of weeks, if you back up, and we're going to look at 1 Peter 3, 8, and you can see he addresses this part. He says, to all of you. This is the whole group together. But, you know, you, you see he's been going through some other groups. If you back up to verse 7, we looked at this the last couple of weeks. He talked to husbands. You go back to verse 1, he talked to wives. You go back into chapter 2, he's talking to um, the employees, the people that were workers. And so he's just been talking to kind of some individual groups. But now, here in verse number 8, he says, all of you. I, I want to address this whole group of you together in this kind of a corporate setting. Now, one of the things that you're, I, I need to, to point out to you, and I'll highlight this a little bit more in just a, a, a minute, but you don't really see it here in the English. Peter is trying very hard with the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to say to us here um, about the uniqueness of a gathering of people. Now, Sometimes, and I, I don't mean to like, I'm not like the grammar police or something, but sometimes people want to try to help out the word unique. And they'll say something like, well, this was a very unique situation. And, and we don't need to say that. When we say the word unique, it already means one of a kind. It can't be duplicated anywhere else. It can't be repeated. It, it was all by itself. It was something special. So we don't have to say it was an especially unique situation or that guy is very unique. We, we don't have to say that. If you say the word unique, it just means a one of a kind. Okay? So think about this. This room that we're in right now will never be duplicated again. Even if the same people attend and sit in the same seats, you're going to be different people the next time that you come in and sit here. right? Because you will have between say if we just go from a Sunday to Sunday, you will have had an experience over the last week, you will have learned something new, maybe there would have been some heartbreak, maybe there would have been some celebration, some, maybe you read something just in your own personal time, you were reading the Bible and something really jumped out at you, you'll be a different person the next time that you sit here. So if we have the same people sitting in the same seats, it still can't be duplicated from what took place before. Every time that we get together, it is a unique setting. And so Peter, in trying to capture this, in this one verse, he has five descriptive phrases that he's going to use to describe all of us together. But as the Holy Spirit was anointing him to write this, three of the five words that he's going to use appear nowhere else in the Bible except in this verse. So in other words, Peter was sitting there going, this is so, when everybody gets together, it is unrepeatable. It can't be duplicated. There is something special that could happen at that one time that could never, ever, ever happen again. And it had never, ever, ever happened before. And so he's trying to capture. And, and so what I sense in him saying this is for almost a sense of urgency that we don't miss the opportunity. We are never going to have this moment again. And you know what? The same thing would happen even if it was just two of you. Even if it was just you and one other person getting together. Even if you said, well, we get together every Tuesday morning for breakfast. It's the same two people. We sit at the same booth in the same restaurant and we order the same food. You are still not the same two people when you show up every time. You have a unique moment. And Peter's saying, make the most of that moment. Don't let that opportunity slide by you. So I want you to see these words, these five things that he tells us about how we are to conduct ourselves when we get together, when we're in this corporate setting. The first one, he says, to live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony. This is the first unique word that he uses here. The King James Version um, says that we are of one mind. The idea is that we, we're focused on the same priority. We're not caught up in like 
what, what's, what's the, the distractions? What's the stuff on the edge that really is not that important? So like I mentioned before, um, like, hey, let's not get caught up on, are we supposed to be singing hymns with a pipe organ or choruses with a guitar? Are we supposed to be meeting in a cathedral with stained glass windows or are we going to meet next to a river someplace? Let's, let's not get caught up on those little things. Let's focus on the priority. What is the priority? Now, in Peter's case, as he's talking to us aliens and strangers, our subtitle to our series was representing Jesus while we visit earth. The priority is that Jesus is seen. Not that people go, oh, that was great music, or that was weird the way that you took offering, or, boy, you guys do communion like that? That's totally... Those aren't the things. The thing is, I saw Jesus there. Jesus was exalted there. He was the focal point. That's the main thing. So Paul, also writing in a corporate setting to the church at Corinth, look what he says in 1 Corinthians. He's talking to the group of um, the believers that get together there. He says, brothers, and here's that thought again, that one thought or that harmony, stop thinking like children. How do children usually think? I usually say that, you know, when kids are learning words, it's mama, dad, dad. You know, those are usually the one and two. And number three is, the, is usually mine. Okay? Um, that's that's a, a kind of our natural bent is that we're like, this is mine. All right? Stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. Don't, don't, you don't have to know all the ugly stuff. But in your thinking, be adults. Let's be grown-ups about this. There, it gets kind of childish when we start arguing over things that are not the essential things. And so when Paul says here, live in harmony with one another, be focused on the thing that is the priority. Be focused on that. The second word that he uses, he says, be sympathetic. This is the, the, the second unique word that he's using as well. For us, probably um, a, a word that would... Um, make more sense to us for this word sympathetic would be empathy when you kind of feel with the other person but at its root this word sympathetic really means vibration really means um, same wavelength vibrating with somebody else get, getting on their wavelength the Bible talks a lot about rejoicing with those people who are rejoicing cry with those people who are crying and Solomon, in, in the Proverbs, he even says it on the negative side. He said, you know, if you try to sing happy songs to somebody who's sad, it's like smoke in the eyes or vinegar on the teeth. <laughs> not pleasant things, right? So somebody's, somebody's, you know, they're not doing really good, and you're like going, hey, come on, shake it off. You know, and you're like this, and you're like, they're like, oh, man, it burns like smoke in my eyes. It, it sets my teeth on edge, makes me grate my teeth, you know. So when, when Peter says this here, when he says, be sympathetic, Pick up what the vibration is of the other person. You know, a lot of times, and, and you've heard the, the phrase that the eyes are the windows to the soul, but you know, a lot of times, we don't even take time to look somebody else in the eyes. Um, you know, we do this kind of, um, as you walk by, you're like, hey, how you doing? And we just keep on walking. We don't really care whether that, they're like wanting to go, I'm really not having a good week, but we're just like, we're just right past them. But, you know, when you look at somebody, when you're looking at them right in the eyes and you say, hey, how's it going? And they say good, but you're looking at them in the eyes and you say, your mouth said good. I'm looking in your eyes. doesn't look like it's very good. What's really going on? What's, what's really happening with you? That's what this, this word for sympathetic means is that we, we get on the vibe with that other person. We, 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 we're close enough to say, hey, how, what's what's happening here? I, we might rejoice with them, we might cry with them. We might what's what's going on? I want to I want to connect with you here. The third thing that he says is for us to love as brothers. This is the word that's in the Greek that's really familiar to all of us. It's really it would be Philadelphia, Philadelphus. Um, it's a compound word. Philo means to to love, and then Adelphus means brothers from the same womb. In other words, if, if your parents had uh, you and another sibling, you would be considered Adelphus. You, you share the same genes. You have the same parents. And that's what, what Peter's saying here. When you get together, these are not strangers. 
because you have both have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it's almost like you were born from the same parents. And just like you would say, you know, some of you might have, okay, my family and I, we don't see eye to eye on things, but we can, we can put aside the differences to get together because we're family, we're blood. And that's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Peter's saying here. Hey, again, let your thinking be in harmony, be vibrating with them, and be willing to put aside some of these other things and care for them like it's family, because it is family. Then he says here to be compassionate. Now, this word, when we think of the word compassion, a lot of times we think of um, kind of lovey-dovey sort of things. But the word compassion always um, is love that is, a, is partnered with action, with some kind of response. So if you look in, in the Gospels, it'll say, Jesus saw the people um, and they were harassed like a sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them, so he taught them. It was his love for them, his feeling the vibration of where they were, looking into their eyes and saying, boy, they, they look a little skittish. I'm going to step in here and I'm going to bring a word to them. Or at another time, he said he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Another time, he says he had compassion on them and he fed them. He gave them actual food to eat. The idea of compassion is having a shoulder broad enough for somebody else to lean on. Or a shoulder broad enough to say, hey, I can carry part of that load for you. Compassion is about the, the, the capacity to step into somebody's life. The strength to do that. Paul addresses that as well in this verse from Galatians chapter 6. He says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. Come alongside and say, hey, you look like that's kind of weighing you down. Can I, can I put my shoulder into it with you? Can I carry this alongside you? Let, let me help you with that. Now this final word that he gives us here though, Live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate. And the last word is the third of the unique words. He says, and be humble. Be humble. The version of this Greek word that he uses here, of course the word humble appears in a lot of places in the New Testament. But this is a, a, a unique word that Peter uses here. And, and it really kind of puts these two together. If compassionate is being strong enough to step into somebody's life, being this type of humble that he's talking about is being gentle enough that they would accept your help. Some people have the capacity to help and they come in like a bull in a china shop. They're just like, I can help, and they just crash through everything, and people are going, well, wait, hold on, hold on, and you kind of overwhelm them. Um, you know, it's, it's just too much. But this is Compassionate is the strength, the capacity to help, and being humble is being gentle enough to help. When I was uh, reviewing my, my notes for today, this picture just popped in my mind as I was kind of thinking about those two words, and it was this, a velvet-covered brick. Something that's strong enough, solid enough that you can depend on it, but it's not rough on the outside. It's, it's not abrasive. It's it's soft. It's I can okay. That's you know that I can I can receive that. And so this is how when 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 Peter says all of you, he's addressing all of us that call ourselves Christians that are aliens and strangers in this world. That this is how we're conducting ourselves. But notice this other phrase that's right there at the beginning: the one another. This is how you conduct yourself when you come together. When there's a one anotherness. Not when you're just by yourself. I love this phrase, one another. It shows up so many times in the New Testament. Um, and Peter, especially, he, he likes this phrase a lot. So just in this first uh, letter that he writes, this one we've been studying, 1 Peter, five times he uses the phrase one another. Let, let, me, let me show you. We've got a list of them put up on the screen here for you. The first one that he tells us, for we love one another, um, and, and right at the beginning, chapter 1, we love one another. We, we go out of our way to be in a relationship with somebody so that we can say to them, I care what's happening in your life. Now something that, that will help you with kind of the velvet-covered brick idea, 
this is a, uh, I, I don't know who originally said this. I, the first time I heard it said, I heard John Maxwell say it, but it's this, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We can also, we could modify that and say, people don't care how much you can help until they know how much you care. Right at the beginning, in the very first chapter, he says, love one another. People have to know that you truly care about them. Not care about what they can do for you, or, or, or care about what you know, kind of function that they provide in a church setting, or in your community, or in your family. But I care about you as a person. I care deeply about you. I love one another. The second time that this shows up, this one another phrase, is the, the verse that we just looked at, chapter 3, where he tells us to live in harmony with one another. We already covered that. Thirdly, the third time that he has one another, I love this one. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Yeah, I'll help. Fine. You know, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, can, can you help out with this? Sure. You know, it's not, not that thing. Yes, I'd love to help. I'd, I'd be happy to help. You know, I, I'd love to do that. And I always loved, you know, the word hospitality, the root word there is hospital. I, I'd love to be a place that is going to bring about a healing to somebody, a place of recuperation for them, a place where they can get stronger, get better. But fourth time in the in first Peter that he says this is that we are to clothe all of us one another clothe yourself with humility kind of what Paul or what Peter already said to us here in uh, chapter 3 verse 8 that that's what our our um, our main when he says clothe yourself with humility that's what I want people to see on the outside I don't want them to go oh well he's you know he's a know-it-all or he's the final authority he doesn't need anybody else's help but it's saying, hey, I'm, I'm humble enough to help you. I'm humble enough to be a servant. I'm humble enough to say, I need help. Clothe yourself in that humility. And then finally, the fifth one that he tells us is to greet one another with a kiss. Now, here's what I love about this. Um, in, that, in, in this culture that he's writing, they, they did kiss. Men kissed men, women kissed women. That was, that was the greeting. If you noticed, um, if you ever see uh, any video of like award shows in Hollywood, the little Hollywood fake air kisses, you know, their, their cheeks don't even touch each other on either side, and they just kind of blow a kiss off into the air on either side. That's not what he's talking about here. I mean, you can't kiss somebody from a distance, right? I mean, you can like go, I'm going to blow you a kiss. That, that's, you know. In order to kiss, you got to be close. Here's, here's what I think that Peter's saying, that kind of carrying over to our culture today. Get close enough to be able to impact the person's life. You, 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 you might impress somebody from a distance, but you're only going to influence their life. You're only going to be able to, they're only going to let you into their life if you're up close with them. If you're close enough to kiss, as it were. If you're close enough to look into their eyes and see what's going on there. If you're, if you're close enough to see, boy, I, I can see, you know, they got a few more lines. It looks like they've been, kind of had their, their brow furrowed this week. What's, you know, what's going on? What's, I'm close enough to see that. I'm close enough to care about that. And be able to step in with that. So, this is an alien response. These are... The, the world's philosophy is got to take care of myself. Got to look out for numero uno, me, myself, and I. And Peter's turning this around and saying, you know what? It's not I and me, it's we. It's one another. It's, it's being all together. Now, Paul addresses this in Ephesians, and it almost sounds like he's going to contradict Peter. So I want you to look. Okay, so we've been looking at how Peter is talking about we are strangers and aliens. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 19. Here's what Paul says. Sounds like he's contradicting Peter. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. Well, which, which one is it? You guys get on the same page. Well, they're, they're on the same page. If we back up to verse number 12... Paul's speaking in the past tense. He says, I want you to remember what you were. You were separate from Christ, 
You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants of promise. You were without hope. You were without God in the world. And then I love the next two verses in, in verse number 13. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. So consequently, he says in verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. Not only are you not excluded, but now listen how he draws everybody together. But you are fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household. Hear that? You, it's not just one person. It's not just a singular. It's all together. In fact, again, if you have the, the King James Version of the Bible there where it says fellow citizens with God's people, it says God's saints. That's another word that I love in the New Testament. Because if you search for that word, you will never find that word in the singular. It's never saint. It's always saints. I need you and you need me to bring out the saintliness. I can't do it on my own. I can't retreat. And that's why I, I feel sad when, when there's people that will say, well, you know, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You're absolutely right. It's not a requirement. For, for you to go to heaven. To go, you don't have to go to church in order to go to heaven. But I feel sad because not only are of what they're missing out on, but what I'm missing out on. If, if, they were, if they were a part of the one another, I would get something valuable from them. And prayerfully, I'd have something valuable to be able to share with them. I would get to bring some of the saintliness out of them and they would get to bring some of it out of me. But see, what has happened over time is that we have changed the meaning of church to be a physical address that we meet at once a week. And because of that, then a lot of people go, well, what's the point? Why do I need that? And that is never what the Bible intended. It's never what Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, this is where you have to meet. It, I promise you, if that's what he had in mind, he would have built the world's biggest, best synagogue and said, okay, after I leave, everybody continue to meet here. He never did that. In fact, a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, his best conversations, his most meaningful conversations, his most meaningful ministry wasn't even inside of a building. It was walking along a dusty road. It was standing alongside of a field. It was next to the seashore. It was on a mountainside. In Acts chapter 2, when the church is born, it says every day they got together. Sometimes it was at the tabernacle, at the temple. Sometimes it was in somebody's house. Sometimes they got together just to eat. Sometimes they got together because somebody needed something, so they clustered together and said, what is it that you need? Oh, yeah, well... He's got some of this, and I got some of this. We, I, we can offer this hospitality without grumbling. You know, Peter that wrote that, he was a part of those first meetings. And that's what church was. Church was not an address. Church was a group of people. Church was a one another. So, you know, I, I showed you Peter had five one another's in his letter. In this letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul also has five one another phrases. And a lot of them overlap. Look at, look at the one another that he has. Be patient with one another. Hey, if you're going to be together, if you're in close proximity with somebody, they're going to get on your nerves. You're probably going to get on their nerves. Be patient with them. Be patient with one another. Second time that he used the one another, he says, be kind and be compassionate to one another. Now, this one is a slightly different form of uh, the, the word compassion that Peter used, that we saw, but they're very similar, that I, I have that strength, but also have that kindness. That Again, that velvet-covered brick. I, I, can, I can be strong for you, but I can also be gentle as well. Thirdly, and it's a, the next part of that same verse, he says, forgive one another. If I came in too strong, I, I, I'm sorry, I, please forgive me. If I missed an opportunity, I, sorry I missed that opportunity, please forgive me. I'll do better next time. And we were going to add, I want to keep this relationship going with you, so I'm going to ask for that forgiveness. Fourth, he said, I love this one, he says, speak musically. Now, that's, that's my summary of this. You know, we talk about, like in church, I, I can't even tell you how many churches that I personally am aware of 
that church congregations have been at odds with each other because of the kind of music that they have in the church. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell us this is how you're supposed to you know, sing these songs and do this many of them. And they're, they're, It's not there. But, but uh, in Ephesians, Paul does say this. He says, when you speak to one another, listen to how he says to speak. When you speak to one another, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. When you come to somebody, have something meaningful to say to them. Have you ever noticed in your life, whether it's a good thing or a, a, a bad time in your life, there might be a song that just resonates with you? You're going through a valley and you hear a song and you go, oh, man, they are, they're singing the words that my heart is, is, that's what's inside my heart. Or there's a song where you're celebrating and that song comes on and you're like, oh, yeah, that's my celebration song. That one is singing the, the high notes uh, of my life. There's something about music that just kind of resonates with us. I, I think scientifically, it's really music uh, addresses both parts of our brain, um, the, the creative side and the more logical side. And music with the, having the lyrics and the melody line kind of addresses both of those. But that's how Paul says, hey, when you get together, find a way to sing into somebody's life. Now, and, and then combining that with what Peter says, vibrate with them so that you know which song to sing. What song do I need to sing? Do I need to help sing the low notes of your life because you're going through a valley? Or do I need to sing the high notes because you're on a mountaintop and you're excited? I want to rejoice with you. I want to mourn with you where, wherever you are. But that's how we're going to speak. And then finally, the fifth way that he tells us one another is that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We looked at this last week when we talked about husbands and wives. It says wives submit to your husbands, and then it said husbands in the same way. And if you weren't here, I said husbands, that means that for you too to submit to your wives because this is, this is where it comes from. He says all of you, the one another, submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus because that other person, has the, they bear the image of God as well. This is a different set up for church then i mean paul goes on after he says you know you're a part of fellow citizens with god's people members of god's household he goes on in the next verse ephesians um, 2 20 you're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with christ jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him the whole building is joined together that's that one another and rises to become a holy temple in the lord and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, his presence is not in this room. His presence is in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means you are the church of Jesus Christ. That means whenever, oh, that's, that's why Jesus said, if just two of you get together, I'm there. That's a church service. You don't have to come together and have all the chairs facing this way and have musical instruments and sing a certain number of songs and, and have announcements and have somebody deliver a sermon. That's, that's not what church is. Church isn't a prescribed setting of and an order of service. Church is two one another's, two saints getting together and making the most of that opportunity, not just casually going by it. My, my friend Chuck and I have this little gag that we do. Um, we do it for each other's amusement because, you know, we'll be on the phone or whatever. Nobody else hears it but us, but I'll share it with you. <laughs> we, we kind of mock some of the surfacey conversations that, that people have. So he'll call me up. Hey, Craig, how's it going? I said, good. It's good. How you doing? I'm good. Hey, how's, uh, how's Betsy doing? Oh, she's good. She's good. And Michelle? Oh, yeah. She's good. She's good. Works good, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for me, too. It's good. How's the weather there in Colorado? Oh, it's, good. it's good. What do I know about him? What does he know about me? <laughs> Nothing. But we do that all the time. We, we say it to somebody. We walk by and go, how are you? And they're dying inside, but we don't even see them as we just walk past. I just felt obligated to say the words. I don't really care how you're doing. 
that we've missed an opportunity. Friends, if we are truly going to be the church of Jesus, we have to be the church of Jesus, not go to a church or go to a place and say, well, I'm here now, so now I can. But just the one another, just two of you getting together. It could be over the phone. Hey, tell me what's, what's going on. What's, what's happened? You know, for some reason this morning when I got up, I was thinking about you. There must be a reason why God dropped you in my heart. Maybe you just sent him a text. Hey, just want you to know I'm praying for you today. Is there anything special I can pray about? You know, they might text back and say, no, it's, it's good. Or they might text back and say, you know what? I actually have a doctor's appointment today I'm a little nervous about. Oh, okay. I'll be praying for you on that. Just don't miss those opportunities. Like Peter said, just with that anointing of the Holy Spirit, he's trying to give us the idea of the uniqueness of when you have that moment together. That's not something that can be programmed and by an order of service. You, oh, let's show up Sunday at this time, and here's our order of service, and it'll magically happen. Don't miss the opportunities. It's fine if we come together have a set time and a set place it makes it kind of convenient right you know so you're not like on Sunday morning where are we meeting today you know you have to find us we're gonna just send out GPS coordinates and you try to treasure hunt us in you know so obviously it's convenient to say here's a set time and a set place but let's not just get into the routine of just doing church let's not just do that now I like to um, not quite wrap up but close to it I want to give you just an opportunity. We're not going to spend a long time on this because here's where I want you to just kind of practice this a little bit. When, when you know, it's, it's typical when, when you come walking into church and you probably haven't seen somebody for the last week uh, to just kind of check up with them. Uh, how, are, how was your week going? And, uh, you know, if we have a little greeting time, you just shake hands with somebody and say, hi, good to see you, that kind of thing. But I don't want us to miss those moments, so I, I want us to practice this just a little bit. So this is just going to be kind of quick. So I'd like for the guys to get together in a group. Ladies, you get together in a group. Um, and this is not a time for, for uh, we're not going to have really lengthy conversations here. But I just want you to maybe look at somebody in your group and say, how are you? Really, how are you? And maybe you have something to share, hey, I'm really excited. I had, a, I had, a, I had a, just a gold star week last week, and, and this is what happened. Or maybe you say, you know what, I'm not really sure because I got something coming up this week, I have no idea how it's gonna turn out, and I'm a little, I, I don't know whether to be excited about it or whether to be a little nervous about it, I'm just gonna, or maybe you say, I do know what's coming this week, and I do know it's gonna be challenging, and it's really <coughs> weighing me down. And, so you don't have to give like the whole history of what happened leading up to that moment, but just say, yeah, here's something I'm rejoicing about. Here's something I'm a little nervous about. And, and let's just take that, that, just a brief moment to pray with one another, to, to vibrate, to be on the same wavelength with one another. Um, and again, when you pray, it doesn't have to be a long prayer. Um, you know, I, I, I think that sometimes some of the most powerful prayers are just what you could type in a text message. I am praying that God gives you peace at this meeting. That's it. We, we don't have to pray. You ever, you ever read some of Jesus' prayers in the Bible? Sometimes they were like this long. You know, somebody comes to him with leprosy, the supposed uncurable disease. Hey, Jesus, if you're willing, I know that you can make me clean. I am willing. Be clean. That's his prayer. Be clean. There's, there's no, like, let's get down on our knees, let's pray, and we call to God, and we give all this prayer. You don't have to do that. God knows what's in your heart. It's the same thing with your, when you're praying with a friend, praying with one of those fellow saints, and they say, oh, I'm struggling with this. You say, God, give them boldness, give them strength as they go through this. That's it. You don't have to pray long. All right? So let's, let's do this since I'm kind of looking at where the guys are. If... Some of the guys kind of this way. You get, why don't you just move towards the back because we got a couple guys sitting back there. And then ladies, I don't know if you want to kind of squish this way or this way. But uh, just take a couple, of, just doesn't have to be really long. Just take a few minutes and pray with one another. With